Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Kelly. I am the Integrated Marketing Manager here at JMIR Publications. JMIR is a renowned publisher with a long-standing commitment to advancing digital health research and progressing open science. Our portfolio includes a wide array of prestigious open access peer-reviewed journals dedicated to the dissemination of high quality research in the field of digital health. This year in 2024, uh, the organization is celebrating its 25th anniversary as the leading open access digital publisher. So this week we celebrate International Women's Day, a day when we can come together to celebrate women's achievements, raise awareness about discrimination and take action to drive gender parity. To that end, JMIR Publications is pleased to welcome you to what I expect will be a very inspiring webinar, Breaking Barriers, Inspiring Inclusion for Women in Medicine and eHealth. Our panel of distinguished guests will discuss the strides that women have made in the fields of medicine and medical research, emphasizing the pivotal role they play in shaping the future of healthcare. Um, I just want to do a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, all microphones will be muted. We are recording this webinar and we'll post the recording on our YouTube channel for future reference. There will be some time at the end for questions. So if you have a question for our panel, please post them in the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, uh, Dr. Carmen Williams. Carmen is an assistant professor in the Master of Science in Population Health Informatics program in the Health Policy and Management Department at the City University of New York. Carmen is also an associate editor for the Journal of Medical Internet Research. So Carmen, over to you. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, it's wonderful to be involved in this particular webinar celebrating International just muted myself, International Women's um, Day today. And I'm very excited with this panel of experts and, and panel of people who are excited about this topic. Um, first, we have Kenrick Cato. He's a professor of informatics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and a nurse scientist for pediatric data and analytics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Kenrick is also an associate editor for J. Uh, J. Mayer Nursing. We have Kelly Craig, also known as KJ, um, is an executive director of clinical evidence development at CVS Health, and she is an associate editor for uh, J. Mayer. We have Caroline Pernin, Pernin, excuse me. Uh, Caroline is executive director of Geneva Digital Health Hub at the University of Geneva, um, focusing on data-driven knowledge management and digital health and enabling science-informed policy making. And Caroline is an associate editor of J. Mayer Medical Informatics and also serves as a section editor for implementation reports article type. And then we have Tina Pernet, who is a passionate digital health and health information aficionado. She is driven by the mission to collaborate and construct robust public health systems. Tina also is an associate editor for J. Mayer Infodemiology. So welcome panelists, very happy to speak with you today um, as we uh, talk about these wonderful topics. You know, um, there are so many, many things where we're well aware that um, women make up a, a lower percentage, uh, less than half the percentage of the workforce. Um, I think the recent status I was 47%. And so we, we hear about some of these negative things, but let's just start with uh, celebrating some of the achievements women have made in this field and in healthcare and in digital health. And so um, let's start. What are, what are some women um, that you are aware of that, have encount that you've encountered or learned about who have inspired um, inclusion in the healthcare field? And I'll leave it open to you to start, whoever would like to start. So um, I can start. So, you know, I'm a clinically, um, I'm a nurse, so I'm surrounded by amazing women, um, both clinically and in the informatics space. Um, the women that come to mind for me are people like Leanne Curry, who um, is an informaticist um, who actually showed me the value of clinical informatics and got me to get a PhD in informatics. 
But beyond that, um, folks like Suzanne Bakken, um, who um, was my um, T32 trained, uh, she led the center um, that it was basically focused on reducing um, health disparities um, in all in all shapes and forms. Um, Virginia Saba, who um, who's a who was an amazing clinical informaticist and developed a clinical um, care classification system that we use in nursing. Um, Marion Ball is also another uh, informaticist that um, is a hero of mine. And um, Patty Brennan, who just stepped down from the National Library of Medicine, leading the National Library of Medicine, and so, uh, you know, there's just, and the last one I would say, Judy Murphy, who worked at IBM and um, the Office of National um, uh, Coordination, Coordinator of Health Information Technology. So that's just a couple that come to mind right now. Well, Kendrick stole some of mine. You stole Sue and, and Judy. <laughs> Um, I would also like to throw in the pedigree of um, Off Subakin is uh, Gretchen Purcell Jackson. So she was my mentor um, at IBM and, uh, you know, for biomedical informatics, you can't find a more inspiring leader. And uh, I would also like to mention, you know, there are countless remarkable women in medicine who have made substantial contributions without often receiving um, the recognition that they deserve. But today I would also like to shine a light on the kind of everyday heroines and science and medicine. And some of them are my colleagues at the GD Hub, uh, Mirana, Sophie, Awa, Aziza, and Amanda. I'm really proud that, you know, we have such a strong woman team that's composed of incredibly dedicated, hardworking women who not only excel in their research, but also drive positive change. And for me, they're really role models, you know, demonstrating that women can play a vital role in science while navigating the complexities of an academic environment and balancing professional and personal commitments. And then, of course, I'm a little bit biased towards my colleagues, but I really come from the global digital health field. So I would also just like to highlight two, three women from that field. So um, there's, for example, Patricia Patty Mitchell, who's a senior associate professor and has worked in global digital health for 30 years. And uh, she does so many activities, and she's also such an advocate for women in science and global health. And there's Smisha Agarwal, who's an associate professor at John Hopkins and director of the Center for Global Digital Health. And she's so passionate about, you know, evidence-driven research and tireless advocate for reforming the structural power imbalances and inequities in global health. And then as we're at Jamie, I think I would also like to highlight uh, Tiffany Leung, who's the scientific editorial director. And uh, I also believe, you know, she's such a vocal advocate for women and, and science and particularly in, in e-health and digital health. So, but yeah, as the others have mentioned, there's there are so many women, so it's difficult to kind of justify all of them by having to pick a few. And to, uh, I guess, comment further on that is I when we were talking about some of these questions in our like prep for today and I immediately had a bias towards like executive leaders I just want to call out that you know where I see a lot of inclusion is actually in, within my peer group um, and it's really been inspiring to see the inclusion that's been provided up above below and around and how I see women in the workplace supporting one another on so many different areas um, and both personally and professionally, which is really remarkable. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. I, I think that was kind of where it was going next too. We we hear about a lot of the achievements um, that have happened from people that we think of as leaders and having the bias like, oh, that must be talking about a uh, leadership, but there are many ways that we, we achieve within our own um, group, peer groups and things like that. And so just kind of piggybacking off of what many of the things you all have already said, what are some of the achievements that have broken barriers in medicine and medical research, really like paving the way for future generations? And I'll, I'll call Tina, did, did you have um, anything you'd like to add on that? Sure, um, I, I think I might have a little bit of a diff different view here. So, you know, I've, I've worked as a professional in, um, 
health policy and and public health at international intergovernmental levels so for world health organization european cdc and especially in these spaces when you work in health information data science health informatics these are these areas of work are still very male dominated so um, you do need to learn how to overcome barriers and navigate challenges to being able to do your job uh, that don't have anything to do with your expertise. And um, so, you know, talking about role models, um, I, I had a thought, uh, I had to think really uh, hard how to answer this because I think actually it's safe to say that poor managers and directors or scientists know no gender bound. And uh, I don't want a job because I'm a woman, but because my expertise speaks for itself. And I want to work in a workplace where people's ideas of gender don't affect the work. So there are structural issues that need to be addressed. And if we we run the risk of, of making some tokenistic representations of trailblazing women, and these issues don't, you know, they don't get fixed alone through visibility. So yeah, these women trailblazed despite major barriers. Um, but I think that we shouldn't be celebrating that they had to overcome those barriers to begin with, um, even if we celebrate their bravery, intelligence, and adaptability. I do, I mean, these are skill sets that we do need to have. And unfortunately, a lot of um, um, a lot of people, and not just women, but people uh, uh, from communities uh, that are not as visible and don't have a voice, um, deal with this professionally in the workplace in science. And um, um, yeah, uh, for, for, for me, that would be my takeaway here, um, uh, because both men and women actually have really carried and supported my, my professional development. Um, over the last 25 years. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And, and I think that's a great segue into talking about some of those challenges and, and opportunities, um, um, kind of these unwritten rules. And so what are some of the unique challenges uh, that you have faced or have seen women scientists face in digital health and healthcare spaces? And I think you brought up a, a few very good ones, Tina. Yeah. Uh, so look, I'm I'm only an expert in in my experience. Um, so you know, um, uh, women who lift up other women can do really big things, uh, even in previously male-dominated fields. I'm a queer woman. Uh, I'm I'm a uh, I work in international health um, uh, globally um, from a very small country. So most of the time, I have to deal with immigration and and other aspects as well uh the the challenges we've we've sort of uh i've sort of sort of described but i think what's really important is to really think about well okay um we need to support or i actually also support uplifting those who haven't always had a voice or a seat at the table so um um a lot of times the people um, that that tend uh, that work in traditionally male dominated um, uh, fields, uh, those that tend to be white, uh, they face extra hurdles to achieve excellence and to be recognized for it. So um, that's a, a, a definitely a challenge. And because that's because they don't always have the access to mentorship, to networks or to know the culture. Uh, of a new workplace and that matters, especially as you uh, develop your career and and professional networks um, and, and you mature mature those. Thank you brought us some very good points anyone else. And I'll just I'll repeat it any unique um, challenges that you've uh, faced or seen women face in this field. I mean, I think just in, uh, sorry. I think just in academia in general, what what <clears throat> Tina also mentioned is, I mean, like in other sectors, there's still like long-standing systemic and cultural barriers, and you know, one of them is being the underrepresentation in leadership positions. And if I, I I know the University of Geneva well, I know Swiss universities well. I read you know all the the reports, the the yearly uh, reports that give all the details and. When you look at uh, the percentages, I mean, 
if we are at the lower levels, you have 60% women making up the workforce in university, but the higher you go up, the, the fewer uh, women there are and, and the smaller the percentage becomes. But it's also something that is not easily changeable. I mean, it's something that, you know, takes it takes a long breath and it, it will take one or two decades. And I, I personally know at the university, we have a lot of programs, you know, to, to help women in, in science, to to help uh, create e equality. But it's something that, you know, also we also have to be realistic in, in the kind of the time frame that we, we can achieve that. So I think we all just have to be hopeful and, you know, continue advocating and also understanding that. Um, even so, we are frustrated sometimes with the situation for, you know, systemic change to happen. It will also take a, a significant amount of time to, to really become equal. And, and um, so, Carmen, you know, as, the, as the, the, the single male on the panel, you know, what I've seen, um, and to, to Tiffany, I'm sorry, to Tina and Caroline's point, um, I think there are those barriers that I've noticed of representation. I'm a clinical informaticist, so in my space, um, one of the things I've seen a lot and think a lot about is the questions and the work, the areas that we see um, clinical informaticists working on. Uh, women's health um, has been something that um, I've been working on uh, specifically around um deterioration of women postpartum or after giving birth. Um, and it's just interesting because, because women make up a significant part of every population on this globe. But when you look at the areas that we work on in clinical informatics, um, wow. women's health issues are um, a minority of, of those topics that you see people researching as, as in the, in the research worlds that I live in. Um, and then also, for example, uh, schools of uh, or departments of of biomedical informatics. Um, you know, Naomi Eladad, who's the chair of um, Columbia's department of biomedical informatics, is one of the few women that I can think about that run those departments. Um, and so, uh, as Caroline um, and Tiffany brought up, representation I think is is something that that I've witnessed is is something that really needs to be worked on. Just comment a bit further on that and something more specific and unique to me and one of my, I would say, career long challenges is overcoming legitimate barriers from an ethical standpoint within some of the departments and the teams that I've been on. Um, I actually left a job because of sexual harassment. And I'm, if anybody who knows me, like I'm, I'm very transparent and I like to bring my whole self to work and apparently on this panel too. Um, but when we think about like some of those sometimes legal barriers, even that come into the workplace for those kind of behaviors that women have to face and, and deal with the consequences of, um, it's overwhelming. And it's also um, to the point where you don't, know how to, you know, move forward um, in, in many ways. Um, and you try to find people to help you and support you as best as they can. But, you know, in the absence of having like lived experience for those situations, you know, how do you reconcile um, the barrier? And, and how do you continue to move forward in a path that you're so passionate about with um, these kind of obstacles? Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think, I think that is a, a great next question. Um, thinking about some of the opportunities um, to embrace diversity and inclusion. And I know KJ, we had a discussion about um, even like what is inclusion and what else needs to be included in that term, you know? Um, so I'll start with you. And so what are what do you think are some of the opportunities for the things that you just discussed? Yeah, so, you know, we, we often hear um, about DEI, right? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so when we think about diversity, it's a fact. That's right. The numbers are what they are today. We're talking about the number of women in, in the workplace. Um, inclusion is a choice. Um, this is where within teams, you decide whether or not you're going to include someone. Right. Um, and then when we think about equity, you know, it's it's the sense of um, matching, you know, the opportunity. 
But I'd like to add one more thing to that, and that's belonging. And belonging is a feeling. So I like to say like D and I may capture your head, but belonging captures your heart. And so when we think about belonging, um, you know, that's the thing I feel like is going to help us move forward um, for inclusion. Um, and to make it, um, I would say, more impactful, right? So when we thinking when we think about belonging, um, it actually is a physiological sense. Um, so I'm actually a former neuroscientist um, by training. So when we think about like the amygdala and you know um, how it invokes these um, feelings of physiological alarm, right, in this region of the brain, and whenever it rings you know, for us in these settings, it can happen in times of social disconnection. Um, and, or like similarly when we're under physical threat and it's um, really interesting when we think about the belonging standpoint and how we can try to create a culture um, to go above and beyond diversity and go beyond inclusion. It's like, how do we actually retain and keep um, teammates and what are the resources that we give to them and how do we support these individuals um, to bring their whole selves to work, um, to improve that culture and how we can um, you know, improve the diversity of the workforce over time. And for women, this is incredibly important to, to have those opportunities to um, improve wherever possible um, the retention. Thank you. And I think, Caroline, we we talked a little bit about this as well. And so um, do you have any insights on on the kind of opportunities also? Yes, I think, I mean, in general, you know, diversity in teams, I think, with very genders, ethnicities, backgrounds leads to better problem solving and creative thinking. And I think particularly in digital health has led to the development of more innovative solutions and technologies and more inclusive technologies. For instance, uh, I think there were some examples from uh, diverse teams that created health monitoring devices, you know, that account for differences in skin tone and medical conditions that are prevalent in specific populations. So improving accuracy and usability across diverse patient populations. And I think that's really something that can be counted to uh, diversity. And then, you know, I also think digital health technologies have the potential to embrace diversity and inclusion by democratizing access to care. Um, the technologies can be used to leverage, uh, can be used to reach marginalized populations who traditionally face barriers uh, to healthcare access, that it, because of the family situation, because of the, the geographic lo location. And at the GD Hub, we just launched two stepwatch trials in, in Mali and Nepal, led by a group of women scientists um, that are assessing the role of telemedicine in providing equitable access to care and really aiming at creating rigorous evidence to help us understand does telemedicine really make an impact or have an impact on the accessibility um, of care for women. So um, I hope that uh, in, in, in two years, we can come back with uh, sharing some results on, on these insights. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And, and just kind of shifting a little bit, I heard, uh, Tina, you mentioned this earlier about how things are, you know, the e-health field and, and digital health has been moving quickly anyway. And so thinking about that, um, you know, how has e-health and digital health field, how has it enhanced the role of participation um, of women in scientific research? So I, I think other panelists are probably going to have even more um, more examples from their own uh, areas of work. Um, what I actually like to say as, as usually the only information scientist <laughs> in, in a team working at the global level, um, actually, human-centered design came out of <laughs> medical informatics, information science, computer science. And these are principles that, you know, we've carried and in our professions, you know, uh, with full awareness of what it actually means to fully understand um, um, a, a person's, a user's or a community's needs and, and, and work with them to fulfill them. So these are the types of values that uh, now, you know, on almost any professional area, including public health, where I now work, um, are, are very key. So then it's a no brainer to say, well, if, if we do need, you know, if we do practice empathic 
uh, human-centered design of systems, of tools, of processes that then obviously diversity, inclusion, and belonging um, and need to be a part of it. Where I do think that at international uh, global health level, um, we are not doing where, very well is um, the, the fact that um, uh, when you overlay, for example, in my day to day job for the last 15 years, I've fostered international networks of collaboration, of scientific consultation, etc., where obviously voices and not just representation, but expertise from low and middle income countries needed to be uh, uh, needed to be uh, present and and, and participating. Um, but um, uh, women, women um, from those countries still don't have have as easily access to the networks, fellowships, experience exchange in international programs, and and when you add on also the long history of colonial attitudes uh, um, in global public health and funding, etc., we actually do need to take a very mindful um, uh, recognition that um, um, we're not only working in our professional areas, in our research or, or in our workplace where we work, but actually we do need to have a responsibility that we make sure that all of, of, of the people who historically may have not been included in international decision-making and networks are, are represented um, and included. And uh, women structurally from low and middle-income countries get like a double whammy and even more barriers. So it's something that we do need to um, uh, consider. So um, yeah, uh, that's sort of my mantra, uh, but I think we professionally know very well the value <laughs> Uh, of how to promote um, and why the diversity really means. Yeah, thank you. And Kenrick, I'll go to you as, as one of our, our allies and thinking about how can the role be enhanced um, and participation of women in this field? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, um, KJ mentioned something that um, I think is really important, which is belonging. Um, and um, when I think about these questions of growing the field, um, I think a lot about, uh, you know, people talk about pipeline issues, really thinking deeply about creating opportunities for individuals um, to come into the field. And um, pipeline has a lot to do with belonging and it has a lot to do with helping to make sure you reduce imposter syndrome um and um making people feel comfortable that they can bring their authentic selves to the field and so that's a heavy lift um i think but that's i think what we need to do and so um really going going back all the way down to uh junior high school high school levels and letting um women girls um know that they have something to contribute to this field, um, I think is important. And there's a lot of work, there's been a lot of work around um, girls in science um, and and medicine and healthcare uh, and and having them feel like it's a it's something that they can participate in and thrive in and and contribute. And I think that's where we would need to do the work really. Yeah, and in inner and and um you know I'm uh I uh I'm Guyanese um and so I know in places like Guyana South America internationally it's actually just creating spaces for girls to go to school and thrive um in school environments to be able to contribute as women when they graduate so so there's work to be done um globally as well Thank you. Yeah. And I think that goes to the discussion. KJ was uh, talking about that belongingness and knowing that you belong here, you know, I shouldn't say as well, but you, there is a place for you. Um, and so uh, KJ going into that kind of um, what, you know, has the field or how can we make the field more available for women to feel like they should be at the forefront um, of driving these uh, technological advancements that really reshape uh, healthcare and and the landscape in general. And I think Kenrick brought up some very good points, but go ahead. 
Um, thank you. So <clears throat> some of the former work that I did at IBM and what I very passionately support at CVS Health is trying to create those spaces um, within teams, you know, um, and scale it, right? So what can I, KJ, do every day to create a sense of trust with my colleagues? How do I support a culture that allows them to be, like we've said, their authentic selves? So there's no covering, you know, we create spaces within our department, you know, to have these larger conversations about culture where it's iterative and we try to do our, our best to always bring some evidence-based practice even into this component, right, of um, development from a professional standpoint, but it's also personal too, right, that, you know, we are not just wearing this professional hat, we bring all of that stuff with us to work, and how can we support, you know, women in particular in the workplace, and, you know, these kind of um, what seemingly are small things to do add up when they are done at scale. And there are lots of organizations that are, um, you know, supported um, from a nonprofit standpoint too. So thinking outside of just what I do in my workplace, but think about um, the commitments to nonprofit organizations and all of their, um, I would say, education and advocacy, you know, as a Native American female scientist, like that's a lot of buckets that I sit in. So there's a lot of different advocacy and ally places where I belong and, and where I feel at home. And I try to um, really encourage um, really just to be human, right? Like that's a really simple thing to do um, and to recognize that, you know, sometimes we have these biases and we need to acknowledge them and that sometimes those biases can reinforce prejudices, stereotypes, inequalities, and, you know, even highlight our differences. But what's important is that we recognize and understand and overcome and see that those differences are so important and that that's like the beauty of diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of ability, diversity of how we communicate. Um, you know, so it's not just, it's not just one thing. And when you roll it up, um, it can be packaged very beautifully to create innovation um, in teams and to really deliver, I would say, um, a connectedness um, that you wouldn't find without putting in that effort. And it really does take effort, but well worth it. Thank you. And I know we're getting close to time for question and answer. So I kind of want to push the discussion along a little bit. But one thing I would love to hear um, are some of your personal stories or your personal journey or some of your peers' uh, successes and even lessons that have been learned along the way. I mean, there's so much we could talk about. Um, but yeah, are there any any stories that you have that you like to share with us? And I'll let each panelist, uh, we'll start with you, Caroline. Thank you. Yes, just uh, maybe coming back to what Kendrick was saying before about the importance of, you know, familiarizing young girls with technology. Personally, when, when I was young, we didn't have any programs on, you know, inclusion of, of young girls in, in technology and so on. But my father was a software engineer. And when I was seven, he started, you know, trying to teach me Turbo Pascal and things like that. Obviously, you know, uh, not a lot of stick, but it was really uh, giving me also the kind of the feeling of belonging and giving me the feeling that I have the right to be in technology and I have the right to like technology. And, you know, it, it's just a small impact and that actions can have, that, that role models can have on, on us around. So for me, I always felt very comfortable in, in technology and I really accredit that also to, you know, uh, having been exposed and, and treated like that uh, by, by my father. And then, you know, after I think there, there's other lessons learned um, and I think there's really over the long run, the lessons we learned to see failure as an opportunity for improvement. And I think, you know, women, from what I see, more often have the tendency to question themselves or question themselves after something went wrong and going over and over about it. But And I personally really had to learn to kind of stop doing this behavior and accepting that you know we make errors we we make we have failure sometimes but we seeing this as an opportunity to improve and you know to errors evolution 
and uh, to, to use that and, and to being able to close a chapter on an arrow we did and, and to move on with some, some learning from, from this. Yeah, that's great advice. I love that story about your father. Anyone else want to share? So Carmen, um, you know, I'd love to share just um, so I'm I'm on the board of the American Medical Informatics Association, Amy, and I've been a member for almost 17 years now. And and just watching um, watching the organization grow and include women more. Um, uh, Gretchen Purcell just stepped down um, as the chair of the board, and Patty Dykes was before her, and um, and and I've just seen. Um, you know how an organization who's in who is being intentional and and trying the best they can to listen to the voices of the members and be more inclusive um i think and try to create that belonging sp that space where people feel like they belong um i just see that as a, a kind of an example of what we need to do more of um and we don't have it perfect at amy and no one's perfect but we are uh, working to do that. And I think we've been pretty successful also with wine, uh, women in, um, in informatics and, and, and the programs that we've been doing with high school students and, and bringing kind of building that pipeline I was talking about. So I just wanted to point that out as, as something that I, I've personally experienced uh, myself. And I think we need to do more of that. I'd like to share, um, Prior to becoming a tenured professor before my industry career, um, I read a book called Every Other Thursday, and it was about stories and strategies from successful uh, female scientists. And like the purpose of the book was like these women got together every other Thursday to create these peer mentoring circles. Um, and that's really been something I've carried on since my academic career and throughout industry is that you find and engage um, women who are going through their a similar time of their life from a career standpoint, maybe even a personal standpoint, and trying to merge those two worlds and finding your support. And it doesn't always have to come from a hierarchical mentorship that we sometimes really put more of a premium on. It's those that are around us and, you know, even virtually around us, even more so um, in this day and age. And it's been really valuable for my career to have those touch points and you know some of these relationships are 20 plus years old at this stage and it just um if you have the opportunity to have that kind of support system it's it's really worthwhile okay well we will i uh, thank you for those stories and and just those uh things like with amy that's wonderful to hear um and Tina, I'll go to you. I know you talked a lot about this inclusive environment. And so how do we foster that? How do we foster this environment and really promote uh, yeah. diversity in leadership and decision making? Yeah, I mean, there's <clears throat> there's different things um, that anyone can do as an ally or uh, or someone that, that is experiencing um, uh, challenges in the workplace. But what what to me personally has this has come down to um, um, having led teams worked in different teams different types of context both emergencies and routine work uh, in research uh, health systems etc. Um, it can actually be summarized in um, a general guide uh, whenever I meet anyone. Um, the opening statement I make an effort is how can I help you. I learned this actually from the first time I was um, I was uh, per, uh, a part of a, a large emergency response, and there was um, one of the one of the colleagues who basically had a job to do on the response, but actually also made sure that everyone was okay, felt safe, felt hurt, and could express all of the stress and emotions coming through at a very high uh, stressful environment. And I've uh, as as I've grown older. Um, and had more uh, responsible, higher hierarchical jobs. Uh, that's more. That's what I've adopted. Is the question how how can I help you, regardless of who I'm speaking with? And basically, uh, coming back to what Kelly was saying, uh, KJ, um, 
just be a good human lift up younger and earlier career colleagues um you got where you were because others helped you whether they were women or men or others return the favor and pass it on i think if all of us did that in a in regard wherever we are sitting um with some help of structural and policy and leadership um that would make a huge difference yeah, definitely that sponsorship. It sounds like you're talking about and and bringing people up with you. Wonderful. And and Kendrick and and you all feel free to answer that same question in a moment. But what roles um, do allies and this could be any gender, any background? Um, what roles do they play in amplifying the voices and experiences of women? Um, so how can individuals become really effective in being an ally and helping dismantle systemic barriers? fostering culture of support and empowering all genders? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's similar to um, what Tina just said. Um, I think that, um, you know, I did work at Columbia University and uh, we had a civility and professionalism initiative. And it really, um, I feel like, boils down to a couple of things. One is, um, KJ was talking about mentoring, providing mentorship to individuals. In, at any level, where whether it's in any place in the hierarchy, but also providing, uh, creating an, an environment that um, that allows people to be themselves um, and is supportive of that. Um, there's so many ways, and that's so many levels, all the way down from, you know, um, you're somebody who had a hard day in the morning, you woke up and, you know, your dog vomited everywhere. Um, and um you're someone who needs additional resources um and and you feel like you can come, you can come to the organization um to your peers and also the people you report to and and ask for that um so having that space and then also um having um uh, uh the the actual structures and policies in place to make sure that people are civil and professional with each other, uh, and that's on every level. So, so I think um, from an ally perspective, it's really um, helping people uh, be the be show up and be themselves and 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 achieve the things that they want to do. Um, so that's the way I approach it. Yeah, we briefly talked about um, this idea. There's and, and, and it's really interesting how in, in digital health and technology, things are moving rapidly and things like that, but we still have this same culture of keeping certain people out, or this is how we're supposed to act, um, instead, in, instead of letting people be authentic and innovate and things like that. So it's very interesting that that's our field, but we still have some of these old kind of thoughts. Um, and so thinking of all this, this has been a great discussion. Um, I'm sure we could have talked more about a lot of different things. Um, this is We're moving into question and answer. So our last question for this particular portion is, um, what is the next step? Um, and so, you know, what are some of the things that our audience can do in their own lives really to, to inspire inclusion? I'd summarize it based on what I said earlier, uh, be a good human and um, try to bring in, uh, realize that we're all humans working in the workplace, uh, contributing professionally, uh, but it doesn't mean that it excludes um, considering other people and also considering your own, your own uh, feelings and, um, uh, regarding the, the workplace or the, the relationships. And uh, maybe I, I just want to emphasize uh, what KJ was saying before also is that, you know, I think the first step in addressing this or making a change is recognizing that, you know, we are all biased and, uh, you know, if we want to or not unconsciously, but, uh, you know, questioning yourself and, and trying to correct or reduce the bias that we have by ourselves and, and trying to make small changes in everyday life. Uh, to address this can hopefully have an uh, impact. And there's actually a, a great book called Overcoming Bias. And, you know, um, 
the author suggests that teams start at ground zero where you know everyone acknowledges their own bias, but you recognize that this doesn't necessarily make you evil or bad, right? Like it's just the acknowledgement and the central tenet in the book is you're not the problem by harboring those unconscious um assumptions, but you certainly can be the solution. So when you uncover them and they're hidden to you, right? You learn how they're form and it's a tendency to favor one thing over another. It's just natural human behavior. And so when our brains are hardwired, you know, with that bias, we also learn from our surroundings and there's, um, you know, physiological explanations for why we find comfort in those who are similar to us and why we're often uneasy with those who might be different from us. And so it's really a battle of two primordial systems, right? Where one, you have the amygdala, it's fear. It's saying, oh no, this is scary. There's certain distrust, there's danger. And the other is the structured connection um, where you're thinking about, oh, there's pleasure and reward in response to things that are unknown. And that when you put these two systems together to interact and, and in a community standpoint, there's great influence that come, come forward from that. And um, really, when you start to ask yourself those questions and think about those discomforts and evoke um, an understanding of that, you know, it can really um, provide a lot of ability uh, for yourself and for those that you work with. Yeah, and, and so um, I thought, KJ, that was great. You know, I think I always think of it also on an individual level. Um, kind of the first step is really listening to other people. Um, and so thinking about listening to hear and understand as opposed to listening to react. Um, and and so um, I think that's another thing that people should consider when they're interacting with anyone that they come across on a daily level. Thank you. Those are excellent, excellent next steps. And I'll just say, just be a good human. I really like, I like that that point, um, really recognize your biases, um, challenge those biases and, and make changes as you go. And then definitely listen to hear and understand instead of react. Those are wonderful tips to take with you. And so we're going to move into our question and answer portion. Thank you so much, panelists, thus far, um, for your input and your perspectives in this particular topic. Um, and so we'll start with our first question. As a social scientist focused on health equity analysis on a global level, I believe there is, among many others, a critical need for contextualizing the gendered aspects of science. Unfortunately, the emerging data sciences are often inadequate for capturing the um, intangible factors of this context. Could the speakers share their thoughts on addressing this important challenge? So to be honest, that's uh, when I when you finish that, um, Carmen, I thought that that's a really big question. It's a it's a tough one. I think, especially with things like gender, um, we need to step back and think about um, how our the ways that we traditionally think of knowing, um, uh, the ways that we have been raised to think about gender. I think. Um, first needs to be unpacked um and and we need to work on that level first and really do some some hard work about that um on a global level that's going to take a lot um because there's obviously high variability in how people culturally speaking people think about um these topics but i think that's where we need to start um so i guess i'll add that you know you you can't measure what you're not counting, right? Um, and like SOGI data, when we think about sexual orientation and gender identity, for example, these are not um, really well captured data, uh, kind of universally speaking. And so as we think about the gaps in data collection and how we use data for good, I mean, how we make sure that there's um, inclusivity in the data that we are collecting and opportunity to have granularity for those you, I would say, current gaps um, are a real a real need for science to move forward when you think about what's the what's the contextualization of those data and how we use them. Um, well, we have to step backwards and actually collect the right data first. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Um, Carmen, can I ask, add one other thing just really sure. quickly? Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, 
you know, to KJ's point also, and this is connected to, um, and I brought this up a couple of times, really working on, on having, um, training individuals in different communities, um, their own communities to be able to do, uh, data science, uh, information sciences, um, so that we can bring those individual contexts and those of individual perspectives, um, I feel like right now the way historically we have it, um, there's too much of kind of outside, uh, for lack of a better word, mostly male white perspectives on how we do the science. And so that needs to change as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think um, this next question, I think it came in as you were talking, Tina. And so you did talk about some of this, um, but it would be nice if, sorry, it would be nice if you could also shed some light on the context of non-Western settings, um, low and middle income countries from your knowledge, how the and how these barriers could be similar or different, not only just for professionals, but also for women who seek e-health or m-health um, and their potentiality on shaping, bolstering the global regional women health um, accessibility, acceptability has important um, challenges as well. And so you've talked about inclusivity and diversity, but if you can just explain a bit more about how it can be implemented. Uh, this is <laughs> this is very complex to to respond to in <laughs> in a couple of minutes. Um, obviously, we need to think about it from the scientific point of view, from the practice the practice, the policy, and the practitioner point of view. Um, and also, uh, in my opinion, um, we do have a responsibility in um, in fostering the transferability and exchange of experience uh, internationally. So from the science point of view, this is a bit of a general statement. Um, but I think actually, in general, in health context, no matter what health context, what we suffer from is lack of um, uh, operations and implementation research that would actually clarify what are the factors and attributes that will determine or influence success of transferability of a tool intervention or a policy to a different context. And that, you know, uh, that is very much grounded in uh, awareness of the, the local community, the local cultural health system uh, practice, uh, uh, other systems context. Um, uh, second, from the point of view of practice, um, uh, there's a huge, obviously, uh, the, way, the way that health systems, professions, and societies across the world are organized are very different. I work now, the, the last um, five years, in the area of health information and health misinformation. That's all contextual, <laughs> even though it travels internationally, et cetera, and humans are the ones that are seeking it and making decisions on it. Um, so um, we need to really be aware of the um, local context and, um, and adapt, adapt to understands both the facilitators and barriers to diversity in a particular setting, whether it's in your research area, whether it's in a program that you're working, etc. Um, and internationally speaking, I think we do have a huge responsibility of making sure that there's a lot more exchange um, uh, and experience, uh, exchange of people's uh, experience and um, in the form of fellowships, in the form of uh, networks, etc., uh, that really uh, center on low, mid no, low and middle income countries. There's such a huge diversity in different regions, in different countries that we don't necessarily practice. And it's definitely not reflected in the literature. One of the major issues that I've always had working for WHO is the difficulty of actually documenting and surfacing the work from low, low and middle income settings because the the resources, the time and the distribution of work and what is important is not the same as in high income countries and therefore people that specialize in a particular area will know who to ask and who are the leaders in a particular country or region on a particular topic but looking into Google Scholar or any of your favorite bibliomatic database, you would not see that. 
and that we have huge blind spots there. Um, and when you overlay this also with female scientists, uh, there's even a bigger challenge. We all have a responsibility to uh, help address through whatever uh, whatever we do um, as as a collaborator, as as a as a scientist, as a practitioner um, uh, in any way. Thank you so much. I think that was an excellent, excellent response to that question um, in, in the few moments that we, we can really talk about it here. Um, and, and thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure to chat with you and, and meet you. And I will turn it over to Jane as we conclude this webinar today. Well, thank you, Carmen. And uh, I also want to thank our, our panelists for taking the time out of your days um, and your busy schedule to um, engage in this discussion. Um, I think it was really, really interesting. And I thank you all for being so honest with your answers. I, I think my key takeaway today is that DEI should become a DEI and V uh, for belonging. And, um, and that we should all leave here today and uh, go out and just be a really good human uh, but I, I thank you for your discussions um, about everything today. And I thank all of the attendees who have taken the time to come and join us today. Mm -hmm.